I'm Heidi Huttner, and this is Coffee with H Times 2. And today I'll be speaking with Noda Howder, the Executive Director of Food and Water Watch. And she has a long history of being involved with environmental issues and fighting for food rights and water rights. And today I'll be talking with her about her new book, Fracopoly. Hi, Winona. Great to have you on the show. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Oh, I'm thrilled, thrilled to talk to you. So your book is getting a lot of attention, and I know you've been traveling all over the U.S., and we are having a lot of issues right now with fracking and, and its impact on water and air and climate change. So could you tell me a little bit about the book and, and sort of the basic, the basic story of it and what it's about? Well, you know, I decided to write this book because in the mid-1990s, I worked on a renewable energy project, and we had the slogan, renewables were ready, and renewables were ready at that time. And yet, all of these years later, we have not made the progress that we need to make to really move into that renewable future. And I decided that I was going to look into how did the oil and gas industry actually get so much power over our public policies. And I mean, they're really able to determine the future of the planet. And so what I did was uh, write a book about the history of the oil and gas industry. I looked at some of the most dominant companies. I examined how the evisceration of our antitrust laws actually allowed these companies to consolidate, merge, and to become so large that they have so much political power. And then I looked at the movement and many of the stories of the people around the country who are fighting fracking in their community and in fact around the world that are fighting to have a, uh, a safe and healthy environment. And in the U.S. now, 15 million people live within a mile of a fracking operation with all of the condenser stations, the pollution that comes with processing fossil fuels. So what are some of the biggest companies that are involved? Well, Exxon is the very largest company. And what's really uh, interesting and disturbing is that the major oil and gas companies that have actually been around since the beginning of the 20th century are among the 10 largest frackers today and they have really shaped public policy over the last hundred really more than 100 years and i'm talking about companies uh, not only exxon which is by far the largest but shell uh, bp and um, chevron so some big names, and they're controlling our, our energy future and, and the climate and our water. So what are, what are some simple things that you think can be done with policy? Because that's really the question here. How can we change this? Right. Well, I think that what we really need is an overhaul of public policy, and it's really about strengthening our democracy. It's really about getting people involved at the local and state level, on these issues and I am uh, enthusiastic about a lot of the movement that we see building in different states where fracking is taking place and even beyond that where uh, there is a struggle for uh, global um, climate justice. So I think that getting involved in politics and elections is one of the things that we have to do to make our democracy work better. And of course, what we found at Food and Water Watch, um, we were the first national group to call for a ban on fracking, is that people really want to fight for the future they want for their families and themselves. And that really all of these uh, tweaks around the edge um, aren't going to get us to where we need to go. We really need to get off of this diet of fossil fuels and that's going to mean a major climate mobilization uh, taking place over the next several years. And I think that's what we're going to have to focus our attention on uh, as we get a new uh, president and new appointments to the different agencies that really 
uh, determine what kind of energy and environment policy we have. So we hear a lot about fracking uh, and natural gas as a bridge fuel. Can you talk about that? Well, I think this is one of really the most shocking things is there's a lot of focus on carbon. And of course, it's very important uh, in the longer term to focus on carbon. It's in the atmosphere for a very long time as a greenhouse gas. And that's why originally scientists looked at a 100-year time frame. But we have about a decade to really get busy in lowering emissions. And it turns out that methane, which is what natural gas is, um, st uh, is a much more potent greenhouse gas, 87 uh, times more potent. And for the first 20 years after it's emitted, it poses a major danger to our global climate. So why are we building another 40 years of infrastructure for fossil fuels, and although, of course, we know in the short term that 80% of fracking has been for oil, we know in the longer term that the justification is for natural gas, and that there are thousands of miles of pipelines, liquefied natural gas plants, and other infrastructure to support this industry. So it turns out also that the big banks, the financial services industry, is in cahoots with the oil and gas industry and is investing a lot of the money in building this uh, 40 years of uh, infrastructure. So that's why it's uh, so important that we educate people about what gas is, that we make the case that energy efficiency is the real bridge fuel, and that we start holding our uh, political leaders speak to the fire. That's so important. Uh, what is your sense of, I know the science is sort of out on this, but there's a lot of earthquakes affiliated with the fracking process. There's also much water pollution. Can you talk about that? Can you explain what, what, what some of the arguments are there? Yes, well, actually it's very well documented that the deep well disposal of fracking waste, so it's not the actual fracking, it's the injecting of the waste deep underground with under great pressure and large quantities of it that is causing earthquakes. And a good example is Oklahoma. And we know in the last month there's been a, a serious earthquake in uh, Oklahoma, about 5.8 magnitude. And Oklahoma, before fracking and before all of this waste injection, had one to three 3.0 magnitude earthquakes a year. Since the, the fracking has taken off in Oklahoma and all of these deep wells, uh, there are now, uh, last year, 500, or rather 857 uh, 3.0 magnitude earthquakes. And if you look at the earthquakes that are smaller than 3.0, uh, it's about 5,000 earthquakes. Oh my God. So we know this is happening, the Geologic Service has uh, documented that it's this fracking waste disposal. And we need uh, real public policies um, to uh, eliminate this kind of waste disposal. Now, the problem is that fracking takes a lot of water. And when you compare it to conventional drilling, it's about 50 times more water than is used in conventional drilling. The national average per well is 1.7 million gallons. But if you look at some states, because it all depends on the geology, Texas, for instance, there are wells that took 13 million gallons to uh, frack. So the oil and gas industry has a lot of wastewater. And of course, it's very polluted with the chemicals that are used in fracking and with um, the actual fossil fuels, uh, which are very dangerous. And every year, or actually every day, the oil and gas industry creates about 10.5 billion gallons of wastewater. And there's just no place uh, to deal with all of this wastewater. And that's one of the real downsides. It's where a lot of the spills and a lot of the 
um, pollution that we're seeing uh, comes from. And then, of course, there's what happens underground when you're uh, drilling and fracking um, two miles underground and nobody really knows what new pathways are created. And on top of that, there are a lot of liquids, a lot of dangerous chemicals underground, brines that have radioactivity in them that also surge upward when all of that fracking wastewater uh, or large amounts of it come back to the surface. So there, there are lots of ways that this is very uh, damaging to the environment and ultimately to public health. It's just extraordinary, and of course we don't hear about that. It's not, we hear the, the terminology, it's clean, uh, d there's no carbon emissions, and, and, and that's not really accurate from what you're describing and in terms of the impacts on climate, impacts on our water safety, food safety, and, and all of the rest. I have, I have one last question for you because we, we have to end soon, but, but that has to do with what people can do at the local level, and I just want to tell a short little story, and maybe you can add to it. I'm sure there are many other stories. Locally in New York, where I live, um, individual counties work to ban uh, the importation of fracking waste. Uh, what you were describing in the Marcellus Shale, some, some of the materials that come up is radio, radioactive and airborne and really dangerous to children in particular and families and food supply and water supply. And so individual counties have banned it. So that's a way in which people can impact local policy, even if they can't do, you know, to, to do national policy as quickly. So maybe you could speak to that. I'm sure there are other counties all over the country that are doing similar things. Yeah, there are more than 500 uh, measures that have been passed by local communities. And of course, I think that is one of the big reasons in New York that the movement was able to come together so quickly and to influence Governor Cuomo uh, to ban fracking. And uh, New York's lucky because it's a uh, state that has home rule, that gives certain powers to localities. That's not true in all states. Mm. But our view is that this is an important thing to do regardless, because really what it's about is getting elected officials educated and to take a stand on this. And so even passing a resolution in states and beginning to do this in a number of localities can begin to build uh, the political power to do what we need to do. You know, I think Florida is a really good example of places where local citizens are really getting involved in this issue and, ban and passing local measures. I know Food Water Watch has worked with a lot of these local groups in doing this. There are now more than uh, 88 measures in 16 counties and cities in Florida, um, either banning fracking, banning wastewater, uh, having a moratorium on fracking. This represents more than 70% of Florida's population. And in fact, when there was legislation uh, last year that would have uh, jump-started the fracking industry in Florida, uh, this um, groundswell of grassroots activism uh, was responsible for uh, getting the uh, uh, the legislature to vote down these bills. And uh, I think that's why it's so important that, get, that people get involved at the uh, local and the state level. And of course, ultimately, getting involved in the state level is very important because every 10 years, Congress is redistricted, uh, the, um, the House members, and one of the things we need to do if we're going to have a more responsible uh, House of Representatives is to have uh, less gerrymandering and more accountability at the state level. So I think we need to get your book, Fracopoli, into the hands of many politicians so they become more educated. We we'll often feel as if they haven't really, they don't know the subject well enough. And, and I'm so grateful for you for, for writing a book that speaks to policy, which is their language, right? Uh, that's, right. What, that's what they understand. And yeah. I thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope you'll come back again. And I am so grateful for your writing this book and all the good work you do. Well, thank you for everything that you're doing and for having this terrific show. Thanks so much for the invitation. Oh, you're I'll look forward to coming back. Oh, great. Thank you so much. 
So that was Coffee with H Times 2. You can see more of our shows on my website, HeidiHutner.com. Thanks so much. Thank you.